Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Integrity Matters by Trinity. My name is Chooks, and today we have an exciting episode um, exploring what it looks like to establish an ecosystem that supports uh, institutional academic integrity. With me in the house today, and, the, and I have the big pleasure of introducing this um, great scholars and academics from the University of Southern Queensland is Jasmine Thomas and Renee De Deschmalier. I'm going to just pass it on to both of you to introduce yourself. Can we meet you both? Tell us a little bit about your academic background, professional experience, and what excites you about the job you do at UQ, uh, USQ. I'm going to start with Renee. Thanks. So my name's Renee de Michelier. Um, I'm currently the director of the micro credential unit, uh, but I have, prior to this position, I was the associate dean learning, teaching and student success with the faculty of business, education, law and arts. Uh, and in that role, I run the um, academic integrity project, which established the unit that Jasmine is now um, leading as well as looking at policy and procedure around academic integrity and how we managed um, cases. And it was quite a, quite a broad sort of project to run. Um, I, what I really enjoy about being in the space is the, is the ability to focus on students. So actually thinking about it from a student success perspective. Lovely to meet you, Renee. Um, over to you, Jasmine. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jasmine Thomas, and I'm the Associate Director of Academic Integrity at USQ. And my background is actually in law, uh, where I started teaching at technology law and privacy law. And then I made the jump onto the professional side of, of the university uh, in more sort of project management roles. And as Renee said, um, she was leading the project that established the new academic integrity unit and I absolutely jumped at the chance to take on that associate director role. So what I love most about academic integrity and uh, this whole area is the fact that it is in every single uh, area of the university is touched by it and it really um, forms the absolute foundation of our degrees and of our students and our graduates. So to be able to work in a space that has that um, a level of impact is a real privilege. Lovely to meet you too, um, Jasmine. Um, we know that most universities are now um, setting up for units that, that um, supports academic integrity. Well, we know that University of Southern Queensland is way ahead of the get curve in terms of having an established ecosystem, already having people who are doing the work and actually um, working out what the investigative process is. So. Um, I think the very first question will go to um, Jasmine, just to get a sense of um, your ecosystem that supports the investigative process. Can you walk us through that process? So the academic integrity unit is a centrally led unit. So we're not entirely central. Equally, we're not entirely in the faculty or within our schools. So by having that, we're able to have um, reach into the schools, but also um, be able to connect with those professional staff members too. So the unit is myself plus an integrity coordinator and our uh, remit is to um, provide that strategic direction for the university. And then we have two academic integrity officers sitting in our faculties working really closely alongside the academic staff and they uh, assist with the administrative process and uh, sort of that uh, those boots on the ground um, to provide uh, the detection and investigative support. So. The whole unit um, specializes in, in detection and investigation, but we're also there to help build capacity as well with academic staff. So this isn't a, this isn't a role that just one particular area can take on. It's everyone's responsibility from markers up to um, heads of school and senior staff and also the support units as well. So the student, um, student support areas, our ICT team, um, all of us are able to work together by being centrally led through through our integrity unit. So that's our, our uh, ecosystem in an overview. That's one to actually uh, admire um, because I, I, I gather some universities are just putting together um, academic integrity units. They don't even know what it looks like. I do know people have reached out just to get a sense of how it's working at USQ as well. Um, so I'm very curious to know from um, hear from both of you um, with the current landscape 
changing. We know misconduct is changing. We know how people, how students cheat is changing. Um, how do you keep yourself up to date with what's currently happening of how students are, um, are, are cheating or, or engaging in misconduct? And especially, um, what are your approaches to deal with these cases as they come up? Because you might have a well-documented process for doing it in the in X in a prior semester. In semester two, there might be something new <laughs> and you try to work out, um, okay, how do we deal with this? How do you keep yourself up to date? I'll start with Renee. I think there's, where Jasmine and I were talking about this earlier and um, one really great way is to tap into the, the Twitter community. <laughs> <laughs> keep abreast of the conversation and, and in the micro credential space I find that as well um it's a really great way to just know what's going on so people will um have discussions around that new things get put up all the time both you know academic integrity like you're describing there and micro credentialing are really fast moving spaces um at, that are actual actually global spaces. So, you know, I think that's been thrown into more relief with COVID as well is that we are really interconnected globally. So those conversations and the trends need to be looked at, not just in our own student body, but what's happening uh, across the globe, really. Jasmine, how often would you do this? So would you be like looking at Twitter like every second day <laughs> of the day? <laughs> Oh, no, I'm definitely not a complete uh, Twitter addict, um, but <laughs> we've got a fantastic community of scholars um, who are on Twitter who I make sure I follow. Uh, also, a few um, there's always a few hashtags that pop up, um, but they're sort of constantly changing. So I, I'm sort of just on there sort of scrolling every, every couple of days just to see what's happening. Um, and if, you know, if there are articles that come out in the Australian, the conversation, um, around this, then it's guaranteed that there'll be some discussion on Twitter as well. Um, so it's a great way to to keep connected with scholars from all across um, Australia, but also internationally as well. So that's um, something I try not to obsess over and add to any social media addiction. But it's um, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a great tool. I think the key there, Jasmine, is about maintaining those networks. It's, yeah. it's finding people and, and maintaining those relationships and people are really generous mm. with what they know. That's what we found through the project is that people, if you approach other institutions and other people in the space in general, they are really generous and they're really happy to sit down and have a chat. So with Twitter, and um, what would you say are common tra trends in terms of, um, cheating and academic misconduct, what, what, what's, what's new since the pandemic? And um, what would you say are the, the motivations for learners? I think that um, everything going online uh, was a change for a lot of institutions and for a lot of students, and they found it difficult to, um, to adapt in some cases. So there is some great literature out there on uh, some of the factors that influence academic misconduct. And we especially um, have taken on Bertram Gallant's uh, sort of seven factors um, of, of academic misconduct and use that as the basis for a lot of our education uh, for staff. So just because, you know, the pandemic happened and, and things may have moved online, I think there are still these underlying um, issues that, that have always been there and will probably continue to be there. So things like stress and pressure on students, um, assessment design is, of course, an important factor as well. Uh, ethical decision making and how students are able to, uh, when, when they are faced with that pressure, how they choose to, to adapt to it and whether they make that decision of, of going to a contract cheating agency or not. But also we need to recognize that there are so, so many different types. So we can get um, quite hung up on, on contract cheating, which of course is the most um, insidious and, and represents um, sort of, I suppose, the, the assault on, on, our, on our enterprise. However, a lot of it is still plagiarism that we notice. And that, of course, can be addressed through um, additional study skills for the students and making sure they understand uh, why they're actually needing to reference and things like that. So I think that the, the pandemic certainly added a few extra factors, definitely influenced that stress factor and students studying online. But the best that we can do is to make sure that our support structures for students are especially rigorous and robust. Anything else to add there, um, Renee? I would just add 
that there seems to be a lot of thought around uh, or assumptions made that the move to online made cheating worse when, you know, with the pandemic. Um, and I think we actually need to focus too on the benefits that it gave students. So there were a lot of benefits that particularly our students gained. Um, we, we're very used to teaching online where we have a large online presence in learning and teaching at USQ. Uh, and, but the switch to online exams was different for us. So we've done online assessment in terms of, um, all sorts of various forms for a very long time, but that online exam piece was a new piece for us when we, when we hit the pandemic, but I actually think it, it drove a lot of change, assessment practice change for us. So it actually really forced people to think about the way they were writing their exams and what they were trying to achieve with their assessments, uh, which was excellent. You know, it led to um, more open book exams, different ways of thinking about exams, different types of assessments, um, it, alternatives to examinations. So some people chose to go to, you know, um, different types of assessments, case studies or whatever it was. Uh, so I think that has actually pushed us into a little bit of a different space as well. So while yes, there was a concern that that contract cheating element may be more prevalent in online exams. I don't know that that was the end of the conversation. So we know that there's been trends. We know that, that um, USQ has established this um, fantastic um, ecosystem. I'm sure you, you, you share your lessons learned at some point. Um, what would you say it's uh, pivotal roles that need to be um, absorbed or created in institutions who are looking to have this, a, a similar ecosystem? Uh, I think the um, most important part is to first highlight that academic integrity is everyone's responsibility and that it's it can't just fall to one team or to one lecturer or, or one um, professional staffer. But I think the, the most important role that you can have is um, around I think there, there needs to be strategic leadership in this space. So we know that we have, um, we've got obligations through TEXA and we know that no matter how good the assessment design is, no matter how good the lecturers are, this is still going to occur. So you need to have someone in the institution who is taking responsibility for the overall vision and to make sure that um, academic integrity is positioned as something that has to exist alongside curriculum design um, assessment design and things like that. So alongside that lead, you also need, um, people who, who understand, um, the detection methods that, that are so vital, uh, especially in regards to, you know, using Turnitin and also using technical data that your, um, learning management system is collecting because that for us has been very useful in detecting contract cheating that previously may have gone unnoticed. So by having, by having a strategic lead, having staff who understand detection from both a pedagogical point of view with that assessment design, but also technical interpretation, and then someone who can also um, go through and um, add an educative perspective. So can we capacity build? Can we, um, you know, can we work alongside academics? So previous, previously I've been part of a session um, with Kath Ellis and Rogerson and, and Kate Murdoch from University of New South Wales and Wollongong, and we really promote the partnership model. So we need academic staff and professional staff to work Not alongside that. each other. Um, but also having someone in the schools too, who can administer the processes. That's another really key, um, key factor for us. Yeah. I think that leadership is, is, is really an important piece, but I think the understanding of how important every element of that ecosystem is, is something that, um, comes through to us when we were, we were doing this work. Um, so don't underestimate the, the importance of the professional staff and the support staff in that journey. They actually play really, really critical roles mm -hmm. in making sure the whole ecosystem works and works well. Um, just to piggyback on that, what would you say, Renee, are where the 
biggest challenges in setting up the ecosystem. I would believe that it came with a lot of pushbacks and a little bit of um, um, tr um, change management and cultural shifts. So what would you sh um, say are the bigger challenges you experienced? I think the communication piece is always really challenging. So how do we make sure that everyone's on the same page, that we're all, um, you know, because that cultural piece is really, really important and it is a shift. You know, I think we shifted the culture from a more punitive perspective to a more supportive perspective. Um, and I think that's a, was an excellent outcome. Uh, so instead of looking at how, um, you know, what had the student done wrong and what were the consequences of that choice to do that behavior that we didn't like, we've looked at, well, how can we support students from the get go? Um, how can we support academic staff members? How can we support the professional staff members through this journey? And mm. how do we actually communicate that so that everyone has a clear understanding of what their roles are, um, and what their piece of the puzzle is. And when they need to put their hand up and say, Hey, this is, this is actually, there's something different about this because you know, some things are going to, cases can be different. So mm. where is there, if there's an anomaly, how do we identify that and discuss it so that we're making sure that we're staying true to our processes, but also being really supportive of the students, um, in that space as well. We, I think some of the pushback that we got that we didn't expect was probably with the professional staff who were involved in the process. And I think probably initially we didn't really understand just how heavily involved those staff members were and how, what a sense of responsibility that they had of, the, of their role in the process. So that meant that they were very, um, they took that job so seriously, which is an excellent thing. And that's what you want people to do. Um, mm. But it was also challenging then when we were coming along going, oh, we're just going to change the process. <laughs> so that, that did lead to a bit of pushback and it took, it, it took me, um, in particular as, you know, chairing that group a couple of weeks of going, I don't quite understand what's happening here before I stopped yeah. and looked at it and went, well, actually these people have been doing a great job in what they've been doing and we're changing, changing the, the boundaries for them here. So. We need to listen to what they're telling us. Yasmin, I'm curious, and um, you can always add to this, is for you moving from academic role to more a more professional role, if, if I'm not mistaken, would you say you understood the challenges from the professional point of view? So I um, sort of, I started out academic, but then for the last five years, I've been a professional um, staff member. So I was lucky to, to see it from both perspectives. Um, but Renee has raised such a good point there that by focusing on support for both students and for staff members, that was such an important um, role to play in the success of, of establishing this sort of cultural uh, shift and um, the success of the unit. So um, I was also surprised, I think, with some of the uh, some of the pushback we got. But ultimately, what we were trying to achieve was consistency across um, across how all the different areas of the university handled academic integrity, which then would um, obviously provide a much better experience for our students, knowing that it was a consistent process, it was consistent, um, there was a consistent mechanism in place, and things like that. So. That was, um, that was quite a, a significant piece, I think, is identifying the support that was required in order to achieve that consistency. Well, this is very fascinating. I've got more questions on that one, but I want to ask another question that's very pivotal to the setup, and um, which is around, I see academic integrity, anyone engaged in academic integrity, um, misconduct cases as going to a counselor, because you get to absorb all of that, and you get to see the emotions of the students first hand. So the question here is how do or what are your strategies to support academic and professional staff who are engaged in academic misconduct in um, thinking first about their well-being and how to manage all of that they're dealing with? There are a couple of a couple of things that, that we do. So we like I'd say all universities, we have an employee assistance program that we make sure staff really dealing on that front line with students uh, know they have access to because um, it certainly, it can be an emotionally volatile area uh, depending on what allegations are being made and 
and um, how vulnerable a student might be or um, also how defensive a student may be. So we make sure that's available, but also we've created a community of practice at USQ for all our academic integrity leads. And they're the people who are um, within each school who conduct those interviews with the students and gather that additional um, information during the student's right of response to their allegation. So by having a community of practice, we're able to sort of share stories um, and keep it. Obviously, integrity is a space that has to be very confidential. And there are a lot of, uh, there. you need to lock down information, basically. So by putting everyone together who is in a similar role, they're able to freely speak about their experiences. And we can all work together uh, sort of as a team to come up with some strategies to, to help them or, or to reassure them or to um, find out ways that if they were to confront that particular, um, that particular experience again, they would be able to, to feel a little bit better prepared. So I think having a community of practice for staff who are actively involved in that space is really important. So people can just share their experience because that's half the, I think that that's often half the, um, the benefit is you can see, okay, someone else has gone through this. It's not just me who feels that, you know, I've made a tough decision or, you know, how do I weigh up the evidence properly? So having people to talk to is really important. Renee, is there any, anything else that you might add in terms of um, well-being of academic and professional staff in the academic integrity unit? I think academic staff as well as professional staff and the unit staff need to be able to have those conversations around well-being. It's actually quite a confronting thing, even as an academic, to have <clears throat> cases in your course. Um, you know, there's a lot of questioning around professional identities that can happen as well for academic staff or for unit staff or for academic leaders in these spaces, because this is something it, it's very high stakes for everyone involved. Um, academic staff may feel like they haven't got it right in terms of their assessment, but we know that that's not necessarily the case. So I think the first step is actually recognising that emotional labour that comes with the space. There's a great deal of emotional labour potentially wrapped up in, you know, jobs like Jasmine's as well as um, the academic integrity leads we have within the university in the academic spaces as well as, as well as the academics themselves. So you do need that space to debrief um, and recognize that when there's really, really busy periods and you're dealing with multiple issues at once um, and you're making, you know, for my role as an associate dean, I was in the, the position where I was looking at all the cases and making decisions around what should happen next. So you do need that opportunity to be able to talk through the issues mm. that you're facing um, with people who understand the space, mm. as well as that access to the EAP, I think is valuable. But you can't kind of do any of those things unless you recognise that there is that emotional labour element to start with, which is a really important mm. starting point. Yeah, I, I really can't imagine the, the, the work that goes into making a decision on, on, a, on a student's life. A, a, a university. So I actually always feel that that's a big burden. So thanks for sharing those um, uh, strategies. I'm uh, moving on. No, now that we look, we've addressed um, a little bit about setting up the ecosystem. We know what it looks like in terms of who should be in it and how to manage um, well-being for professional academic staff. There is this big bubble we are hoping to move into where we engage student voices in um, academic integrity initiative. Um, first of all, what are some strategies to involve students in um, academic integrity initiatives? And do you see this as a great idea in terms of um, supporting the university's um, strategy towards better academic practices? Uh, so engaging students in the conversation is so important uh, because this is about this is about them and this is about developing their um their professional identity it's about connecting academic integrity to professional values and making sure that they understand the the work that they do and and the mere fact that they're at university this is where they can develop and grow and this is where they can start making these connections 
So it is, it's very important to, to engage them. Uh, for example, we have a, an integrity working group that, um, was formed, um, by, by Renee for the project, uh, that had student representation on it. And we're also, um, looking to develop a student champion program as well, um, within the integrity space. So students, uh, respond very well to their peers. So any opportunities to um, embed academic integrity within peer mentoring programs or um, just within the the general student sort of populace is a, is a really good thing. So those are those are some of the things that uh, we're doing and we're also looking at, but just making sure that that any um, opportunity for student involvement is is taken. Great. I, th I think there's, these are really good initiatives in terms of um, the, I'm trying to think about a way to, to frame this, where to, as part of an, a setting up examples of what's good work for students, is actually engaging them in the process of doing good work, which is what you guys are, um, at USQ are trying to do. Um, just for us to wrap up, there must be, there must have been lessons learned in setting up your ecosystem. You must have um, thought about, oh, we did that. We're not doing that next time. Um, for anyone who we're introducing or trying to support in setting up the ecosystem, they, um, there are things you'd say you shouldn't consider. Is that this is what worked and what worked. So we're going to start with um, Renee on this one. What are some lessons you've learned in terms of how you've set up the uh, ecosystem, supporting your staff, your students, and actually getting um, the, the institution on the same page? One of the things I would do differently would be to give ourselves more time. Um, we, we, you know, there's a whole range of factors that come together at once, including COVID. Um, and we needed to refresh our policy procedure. Um, and we were looking at things in different ways very quickly. So sometimes you don't have choice. It just needs to, you need to get in and get done, but, um, take the time to actually think through because so those sessions and Jasmine and I had several of them sitting together going, how do the bits connect? Have we actually thought through the, the information flows, the work flows, the, where do students come in? You know, where's the professional staff? How are we feeding the information back to academic staff and to heads of school so that we're improving practice at the same time? Um, it is a really big complex piece of work. Um, so it does need some time to, to get there. And often we start with the policy and procedure piece that becomes a kind of driver. Um, it was for us, the policy and procedure was, it was definitely a driver, uh, but it's not the be all and end all. And it's mm -hmm. actually the bits that you, you put in around it. And it's, it's little things. Um, one of the things Jaz Jasmine didn't talk about just before around student en engagement were the socks, USQ socks, a little bit of, um, merch goes a long way with students. <laughs> 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 there can be some really out of the box and, you know, clever ways. Jasmine did some really great stuff, um, with memes and, and all sorts of things that engaged academic staff as well. So just because it's a, um, you know, we're looking at defined policies and procedures. We're looking at processes. We're looking at set ways of working. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't still be thinking out of the box. Um, that's both in terms of engagement and in terms of learning and teaching. It's a great opportunity to drive learning and teaching refresh and renewal as well, particularly around assessment. Jasmine, anything else to add to that? Yeah. Um, Renee's made such a great point that even though this is a very serious area and it's very much uh, driven by our policy and procedure, there is room to be creative in, um, in your courses, in your engagement with staff and students. And I'd highly recommend, uh, not being afraid to sort of try different things, try different methods of doing so. Um, a bit in terms of also, uh, you know, lessons learned, um, the main one for me was identifying the stakeholders. So making sure that, you know, every single person who will be part of this process and then making sure that they're adequately consulted and they know, um, they know what's coming. So that change management and communication, um, is a very big piece. It's not just something that comes after you've, you know, redesigned your policy and procedure. It's something that has to be, um, evident throughout your whole, whole process. 
um, but also uh, development of an online system as well. So that was kind of happening alongside the policy and procedure piece for us. Um, and that was a very, a very large uh, body of work that, again, was dependent on knowing who was going to be using our system, um, what restrictions were needed, what permissions were needed and things like that. Then, of course, the educative piece after that to Ooh. make sure that people could use the system and and everything was working well. So um, it's very much, I think, a, it's also a people-driven um, process for success in this area. Know who your stakeholders are and, and make sure that they're always in conversation with you. Fantastic. I um, want to be say a big thank you to Jasmine and Renee for jumping on today's episode and, and sharing a little bit about how you set up your ecosystem to support um, academic integrity of all things, academic integrity in your institutions. Um, uh, this, this would be a good springboard for institutions who are the, the beginning of the, of the conversation in setting up your unit and hopefully they take out or learn something from this. This has been a very insightful and I want to say a big thank you for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you.